And so it begins. Prime Minister Theresa May has triggered Article 50 to take the UK out of the EU. That means Brexit negotiations can now officially get underway and must be completed within two years. Let's go straight to London now and Matthew Moore is there for this special Brexit edition of Money Talks. So Matthew, a historic day then. Certainly is, as are in the words of Prime Minister May, there is no turning back. The Prime Minister's official letter, and we have it here from number 10 Downing Street, was delivered this afternoon by Britain's ambassador to the EU. And we're going to show him now handing it over to the President of the European Council, Donald Tusk. And this is the crucial bit. I hereby notify the European Council of the United Kingdom's intention to withdraw from the European Union. Let's listen to May facing Parliament and to Tusk's response in Brussels. A few minutes ago in Brussels, the United Kingdom's permanent representative to the EU handed a letter to the President of the European Council on my behalf, confirming the Government's decision to invoke Article 50 of the Treaty on European Union. The Article 50 process is now underway and in accordance with the wishes of the British people, the United Kingdom is leaving the European Union. So here it is, uh, six pages. The notification from Prime Minister Theresa May triggering Article 50. There is no reason to, to pretend that this is a happy day, neither in Brussels nor in London. After all, most Europeans including almost uh, half the British voters, wish that we would stay together, not drift apart. Uh, as for me, I, I will not pretend that uh, this is, that I am happy today. Well, quite an emotional Donald Tusk there. Well, those are the politicians. What about the people? What concerns them about the Brexit negotiations? Well, we've been travelling around south-east England, talking to city slickers, farmers, waiters and manufacturers. They all have their own particular concerns, albeit in very different settings. The English countryside in spring. An idyllic, peaceful place. But Brexit is shaking things up. The boss of this hovercraft business in Kent tells us she's glad to be getting out of Europe and away from its stringent regulations. She believes the UK now has a better chance of striking lucrative trade deals with the rest of the world. Her main concern now, then, is the Brexit bill. How much will the EU charge? I think it's something that will need to be negotiated. Um, however, I, do, I don't think it will ever come to the point where it's a really huge bill. When you negotiate with someone, with uh, another company or with somebody else, you always go, everyone goes in with their highest point they can. So whether they're saying the latest figure of 60 billion or 100 billion or whatever the EU is bouncing around, realistically, they're not going to go in with the lowest offer that they're going to go on. <laughs> At a farm nearby, orchards are blossoming. At harvest time, the farmer will hire around 80 people from Eastern Europe to do the jobs locals just don't want to do. Farmers are deeply worried. They want to know if they'll still be allowed to employ seasonal workers from the EU after Brexit. So the, bar the farmer's biggest concern here is for labour, for farm labour, for seasonal workers to pick the fruit and vegetables. Um, for example, now we use 80,000 seasonal workers and in 2021 that will rise to 95,000 workers that will be needed. And if we don't get the workers, then the fruit and vegetables will just be left on the ground to rot. So this cherry orchard will be ready for harvesting in around about three months' time. But already, farmers are seeing a significant drop in the number of Europeans who are applying to work here. Well, those are the concerns from the countryside. Let's go to the city now to find out what's concerning them. A little tension on the trading floor, nothing too serious. But what's really bothering the city right now is the uncertainty around Brexit. The financial services industry brings in tens of billions in revenue for the UK government and is one of its biggest employers. 
Mike Ingram has worked in the city for over 24 years. Well, the city's main concern in respect of Brexit is that the, uh, the financial services industry will lose what we call passporting rights, the right to sell financial uh, goods and services into the rest of the EU. It's not only um, important for UK companies, but it's also uh, important for companies outside of the EU, um, such as US investment banks, who are using the UK as a launch pad into the central market, uh, into the single market. Three million Europeans live in the UK. A million Brits live in the EU. Their right to remain is also on the negotiating table. Lucinia Kukowska is from Poland and has lived here for nine years. But for the first time, she feels unwelcome. I think I wouldn't be asked to leave, but difficulties to find a job or to keep the job as an immigrant from a different country, um, it would push me to leave. These are uncertain times for everyone. Negotiations are expected to last two years. And to quote the Foreign Secretary, no one here believes there'll be a piece of cake. Matthew Moore, TRT World, London. Well, joining us now from Cardiff in Wales is Professor Patrick Midford. Uh, he is uh, in Wales there, as we said. And uh, in the studio, we have Vicky Price, the Chief Economic Advisor at the Centre for Economic Business and Research. Uh, Vicky, we'll start with you since you are in the studio with us. I want to go through this letter from the Prime Minister because Brexit appears to be happening, uh, whether you like it or not, and we ought to put that to one side and get out our crystal balls. Now, uh, the, the Prime Minister is basically saying when it comes to the right to remain, which was the last point made in our report there, uh, that we ought to put our citizens first, she says here, and also reach a early agreement about their rights as quickly as possible. What do you predict will happen with these uh, 3 million Europeans here, 1 million uh, Brits abroad? I think the Europeans are going to insist that that is one of the issues that's sorted out as quickly as possible because, of course, there's such uncertainty. We've already been hearing in your reports that people are not coming here. There are right. huge sectors of the economy which are completely dependent on EU labour, construction sector, for example, the National Health Service. Uh, and, of course, there are loads of people here who have... Uh, loads of anxieties in terms of whether they will be allowed to stay and even if we say this of course they can uh, they can remain the question is can they all is it those who've been here for five years is it a cut-off date of today or is it going to be a cut-off date of 2019 when we are officially supposed to be leaving so there's loads and loads of uh, issues that need to be sorted out and I'm pretty certain that that in addition to how much money Britain will have to pay to exit uh, the EU um, yes. are going to be the two issues which will have to be discussed that very is, early on. Yes, we're going to come back to that in just a moment let's go now to Patrick Minford in Cardiff uh, let me ask you about what the the farmers union in Britain raised the issue of uh, seasonal workers do you think that that is at risk or do you think they will strike a deal to make sure the fruit doesn't go rotten on the vine as, as she mentioned I think there'll be a lot of pragmatism over of pragmatism. immigration of unskilled workers because the, the, the main problem with unskilled workers is if they bring their dependents and stay indefinitely, they cost a lot of money to the taxpayer because of all the benefits and tax credits and so forth that they get, an average of about 3,500 per adult unskilled immigrant. And that's, that's the issue. So as long as that can be tackled and the um, agricultural uh, work um, farmers that hire them are willing to make sure that they don't uh, get all those benefits, that they come and they go, or that they don't bring their dependents, I'm sure that that will be resolved. OK, we have an interesting uh, point here, Vicky, inside this letter to Donald Tusk, where the Prime Minister is linking security with a good deal. Is that a wise thing to do? Uh, is, is Britain really so strong that, that their security contribution is so strong that you can use that as leverage on the European Union? That was actually a very surprising part of the letter. Uh, in other words, what she's saying is that uh, we want to achieve uh, sort of joint prosperity and joint, joint um, security cooperation, and we don't want to reduce any of that from where we are now. Uh, so, in other words, it's almost like a threat. Yes. You know, we're now giving you all sorts of support. Threat, yes. Exactly, we're giving you so much support um, on this. Although, of course, we get an awful lot of support in terms of intelligence from from other countries in the EU. Uh, and therefore, if you stop giving us the type of economic cooperation that we mm. want, we won't cooperate on security. And I think that's a very, very dangerous. Pr thing Professor Minford, uh, do you think that that is a wise tactic by uh, 
the British government? Look, everything is going to be discussed in these negotiations, including security and our contribution to NATO, which is absolutely vital to European um, countries in the EU, and particularly in the East. So it's obviously everything is going to be discussed. And you've got to remember that the EU has started off by demanding 60 billion, which is kind of a fanciful figure. So that will also be discussed straight away. And so will trade, which is probably the most difficult thing because the EU there has a very protectionist regime and we want to go for free trade. So everything is going to be on the table, I think, from the, from the first moment. And you've got to remember that the whole question of foreign nationals, the EU refused to discuss it until, until the whole Article 50 was triggered. We were anxious to deal with it very early on, but they refused. Let's just pick up on the Brexit bill, which was one of the worries raised in the report by the, the owner of the hovercraft manufacturers. As she was saying 60 billion, and a lot of people have said 60 billion. Where does that figure come from? And are the British uh, duty bound to pay that sort of sum? Well, the first thing to say is that nobody has asked for that, that figure yet. So there have been leaked reports from what officials may perhaps have been saying. But the second thing is that indeed the UK, by being part of the EU, has committed to paying various pensions for uh, people who work in the Commission, so various programmes that we've already been investing in, if you like, which are part of the budget that we're supposed to be in until certainly 2020. There are some uh, obligations that go beyond mm. 2020, in fact. Uh, and those are expected to be met by any country that decides to leave. In other words, you can't just say, right, I'm going, I'm not going to pay any of the stuff that I actually owe. It's like saying to Greece, for example, yeah, OK, so you want to leave the, the EU or the euro, you don't have to pay us anything back. Well, that's you know, from the huge debt they have. So it is equivalent to this. Now, the question is, are we going to be dealing with this in a serious way or are we going to be playing games again? So uh, the UK is supposedly thinking in terms of three billion or perhaps paying nothing and just walking off. That is not a credible position to be in. I think if we're going to be discussing all these issues, as Patrick Minford is saying, in a sensible grown-up manner, then you need to actually look at what you owe and your obligations in a sensible grown-up manner okay, too. We should see. Okay, Vicky Price, thank you so much. And Patrick Minford, thank you. As I'll back to you in the studio for more analysis. Matthew Moore in London, thank you so much. So let's take a quick look at some reactions to this historic event. Starting with the UK's main stock index, the FTSE 100. It opened higher than Tuesday's close, but by mid-morning it had fallen into negative territory and fell further as May spoke in Parliament. And the British pound charted a similar course, strengthening, strengthening in the early part of the day against the US dollar and then giving up those gains later on. Now, investors remain concerned that the EU will not back down on its demands on the British government. But what are ordinary people saying? Well, some like this Twitter user are happy that Brexit has begun. This person saying that all British companies have to comply with EU laws, but only 5% actually export to the EU. Others, though, expressing a note of caution. This meme going around online showing the UK breaking free of Europe like a butterfly. But Rebecca Stimson points out most butterflies die within two weeks. Others, like Helena, simply say she's heartbroken and ashamed to be British. And what about people from continental Europe? Well, Marcel Rice from the Netherlands says, goodbye UK, it's been fun. Sorry you chose economic suicide over working together to tackle modern problems. And we went out onto the streets of Brussels, the heart of the EU, and asked ordinary people there how they think Brexit will affect their livelihoods. Well, there will be, of course, a difference in the financing of the whole European project, but, uh, well, I'm hoping that they will somehow manage to, to, to handle it. That's a, a big stress for the, the enterprise, for the, the stock exchange, for the, the currencies. Uh, that uh, should be uh, everything could happen now. I think that the, the British will lose more than, than we will lose. And it's really, I'm sorry for, about that. But if they want, like a divorce, if the men want to go out, go out. <laughs> And our editor at large, Craig Capitas, joins me now live from Paris. Craig, thanks for being with us. Uh, now, that last lady that we heard from Brussels thinking that uh, EU, the EU is going to come out on top after two years, what are, you th what are your thoughts on this? 
Well, you can parse this a million ways, and it is being parsed a million ways, but there's two important takeaways. Number one, the triggering of Article 50 has tattooed the European Union as an oligarchic structure riddled with corruption and built on the denial of any sort of popular sovereignty. Number two, the individuals that Britain sent to negotiate with, uh, to, to fix the EU were not statesmen. These were what Margaret Thatcher called wets. They were boiler room politicians who pandered to the lowest common denominators of fear and loathing. And they, what England should have done, Britain should have done, is gone down there and, and taken on this runaway train of arrogance and gravy and say, fix it, because the EU is good for Europe. But they didn't do that, and they got bamboozled and bumfuzzled by the Eurocrats, so they went home. It's a shame. Craig, one final quick question. We've heard some tough talking from Angela Merkel, also from Francois Hollande, where you are. Uh, is this the kind of rhetoric we're going to see over the next two years? <laughs> this isn't about rhetoric, Azar. The United Kingdom is now officially the poster country for EU incompetence on both sides of the channel. Now, if you want to go visit the theme park, where you can fully experience the feckless fallout of the EU, go to Greece. Go visit Greece. Craig Peters in Paris. Thank you so much. <laughs>